everyone, my name is Kira Griffith, um, and I currently serve as president of the Residence Hall Association. Um, I'm here to welcome you today to our virtual town hall discussion. Um, and just for some background knowledge for everyone, um, RHA is the student governing body that represents and advocates on behalf of all on-campus residents. Um, and so today I am very excited to be welcoming three members of the Carolina Housing Department's leadership team. Uh, the Executive Director for Carolina Housing, Alan Blattner, uh, Senior Director for Residential Education, Kayla Bullitt, and um, the Director for Administrative Services, Rick Bradley, who will be joining us um, right around one. Uh, so today I'll be moderating this discussion alongside our very awesome Vice President, Eliana Alexander, and we'll be asking some anonymous questions that were submitted online uh, via our form. And at the end, we will be opening it up to live questions. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Ellie. Thanks, Kira. We want to remind you all that this discussion is about reflecting on fall 2020, as well as preparing for spring 2021. Our overall goal is to provide context on what occurred in the fall and elaborate on how lessons learned will be applied in the spring for the benefit of residential students. We want to remind you all that finalized plans for the spring have not yet been released, which means that Carolina Housing may not be able to answer every detail regarding the roadmap. However, once these plans are finalized, they will be communicated appropriately and in a timely manner. Let's remember to have patience and empathy for the leaders who are working to ensure that spring on campus housing is as safe and welcoming as possible. Mm -hmm. And going off that, we want to say a huge thank you to Carolina Housing for being so receptive to student feedback and taking the time in their busy schedules to have this town hall. Uh, we really appreciate their tireless advocacy for on-campus students and are incredibly grateful to be able to work so closely with you all. Um, so throughout this conversation today, uh, we almost commit to being open, uh, to engaging in dialogue, learning from each other's experiences, and creating a space that values and respects differences. Um, so with these guidelines in mind, I'm going to turn it over to our Carolina Housing leadership to introduce themselves and share a few opening words. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for both for those kind words and for organizing this. I think this is a great example of the leadership RHA has shown throughout this challenging time. So thanks. Um, I also want to thank all of you who are joining us today. Um, you know, you're a subset of the 9,000 students who at one point or another over the past year have chosen to live with Carolina Housing since the pandemic began. Um, some of you moved in and have remained with us. Some of you moved in and then out. Um, and some of you opted early to make different plans uh, based on you or your family's circumstances. And so, you know, there's really a wide variety of needs that we have tried to meet um, since if we can remember way back in March when this whole thing started, um, while you all were on spring break and we were here on campus trying to figure out how to manage the early pieces of this uh, now nine month um, episode. Um, I guess I wanna start by just recognizing that, and we've said this in letters, but I think it bears repeating face to face, if you will, um, that we recognize uh, that everybody has had an impact based on this. This has caused students heartache. It's caused you disruption to what you thought was going to be a hopefully an otherwise normal semester. Um, it's caused uncertainty and stress, disappointment, anger at times. Um, you know, and I just want to acknowledge that all those are, you know, are very real and they're not just contained to the emotions that students are having. You know, uh, our staff feel the same way. This is not what any of us signed up for. Um, but yet here we are. Um, and so I really do want to acknowledge all those, uh, you know, all of those things and more, even, you know, emotions and things that I did not list. They're very real and they, they exist as we're trying to navigate our way through this. Um, we appreciate your flexibility and your resiliency. I mean, that has always been the hallmark of a Tar Heel um, and it's never been tested in, in quite the same way that it's being tested now. Um, and I know that that, that too has an impact. Um, you can only be resilient for so long before you're exhausted. Um, and I think, you know, we all have different capacities, but I know many of us are, 
um, seeing um, and feeling that in, in really profound ways. And this break comes at just the right time in many ways um, to, to help hopefully that, uh, that recovery period. Um, I really wanna acknowledge the staff um, both the, the student staff that, that, that returned, was trained and began this adventure with us, um, going all the way back to last spring, the staff that were a part of our, of our um, operations between August and February. Um, you know, there, there have been two very significant pivots um, that we have had to endure. Um, and, uh, and I just wanna acknowledge that. I also acknowledge the full-time staff, the housekeepers, uh, the maintenance staff, um, the CDs who continue to live, work, and do amazing work in the buildings, um, all the staff behind the scenes that have helped us restructure our budget now six times, trying to cope with the various elements of this thing. I mean, there is not one aspect of our, of our staff that haven't been deeply touched by, by what's gone on. And again, I would reiterate that none of it's been easy. Um, so I really want to express thanks you know, to that group. Um, I think it's also worthwhile to pause for a second and just acknowledge the complexity and the interrelatedness of all of these things. You know, we have heard, you know, housing's decision to do this and housing's decision to do that. And I just want to set a little bit of context for that. Um, we certainly are in a position where as part of the university, we're helping to operationalize the roadmap. Um, and in there, we have some agency in terms of some of the decisions that get made. But many decisions that get made are done in an institutional context because they're so interrelated with everything else that happens on campus. You can't separate out how we should operate housing from what kind of classes are happening, from what's possible in dining spaces, and what kind of transportation is available around and to campus. That's just a few examples of the interconnectedness of all of the different pieces and parts that have had to go into the university's planning. We have certainly been at the table, been asked to lead, been asked to follow when appropriate. Um, and we've, you know, we have worked together with the chancellor and the leadership, with the system representation and their guidance, with the guidance of Orange County Health and, and CDC and all the different public health entities that we lean on for good scientific guidance to underpin everything we do. Um, but it's, it's not just a matter of a single decision in a single point of time. I think one of the things we've learned over the past nine months is this is fluid, it is ever changing, and that there is rarely a decision that while it may have huge upsides, doesn't have significant downsides. Um, we're not looking for a path that is clear and, and, and uh, you know, uh, easy to follow. We're trying to create a path where there isn't one and where I would say all the elements work against having a clear, clean, crisp path forward. Um, and so, you know, I, I like some of the opening words that were shared about, you know, what we need to bring to that kind of an experience. We need to bring flexibility and understanding and grace and we certainly have felt that in housing from many of you. We've also heard your level of disappointment and um, you know, wishing that things had been, had been different and, and we share that wish. Um, so I hope what we can do today is you know, kind of talk through some of what we can, um, you know, share a little bit about how that informs what we hope to do in the spring and, and use that as kind of a, as a, as a launching pad um, for really I, what I hope is just a, is just a great discussion. Um, you know, I guess as I close the opening remarks piece of this, you know, we, we really are committed um, and dedicated to providing the best living experience we can at Chapel Hill. Um, as we prepare for spring, we're gonna provide information about our university plans and our housing plans. Um, you know, through it all, we'll continue to collaborate not only with our campus, um, partners on the, on the staff and faculty side, but I think even more importantly, um, with you, our students, with RHA and all of the other groups that are out there that are willing to be a testing ground for ideas and to, to, to help us try and navigate this. You know, we've leaned on that in the past and we're gonna continue to lean on it going forward. Um, and I just, I, I guess I wanna say on behalf of, of the staff, we can't wait to get back to our normal 
op opportunities with you to form engaged, you know, communities within our buildings uh, that are full of all the rich programming we, we share together with the opportunities to connect with one another. Our buildings are built, our staff is built to foster connection. And we've been tested over the past few months to figure out how to leverage those same resources to try and stop people from connecting. It's not the normal Tar Heel way. It's not what Carolina housing is built for. Um, and we're continuing to move along that path as quickly as we can and just continue to ask for your patience and grace as we, as we do that at a pace that not we are in control of, but that this pandemic and the science around it are in control of. So uh, that, I just wanted to share the, you know, a few thoughts there as kind of a, as a backdrop. And I'll uh, also invite my colleague Kayla to jump in and, and, and share anything else. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm so excited that you all are able to join us. I wanna say a special thank you to RHA um, exec board and uh, leadership team for putting this together. Um, my name is Kayla Ballet. I serve as the senior director for residential education. Um, and in that role, I have the privilege of working with all of our residential education staff. So uh, that's everyone who lives in the communities and the buildings and essentially create the, uh, the life on campus that you all have experienced hopefully at some point um, or will experience. So I'm glad to be here and uh, I just uh, hope that we can address and answer any questions you may have. Awesome, thank you both for that. Um, and so before we jump in and get started, I'm gonna have um, our Vice President Ellie share some housekeeping items and then we'll jump into questions. Awesome, so as Kira shared, we'll be navigating through pre-submitted questions during today's town hall. The RHA Executive Board will also be monitoring the chat for additional comments and questions. Then the last 20 minutes of today's discussion will be reserved for live questions. And at that time, you may raise your virtual hand to share a question verbally or type your question into the chat. In the meantime, please remember to keep your microphone on mute while others are speaking. And you are free to keep your camera on or off depending on what you're most comfortable with. That's it. Let's dive into the first few questions. All right, thank you, Ellie. Um, so just to reiterate for everyone who's joined us today, the goal of this town hall discussion is to provide context on what occurred in the fall, um, acknowledge the sentiments of students, and also elaborate on how the lessons that were learned in the fall can be applied in the spring for the benefit of residential students. Um, so to start off the discussion, we're going to focus on two questions that were brought up about the fall semester. Um, and the first question, uh, says with the student or with the sudden transition from in-person to remote instruction this past fall, could you speak to what steps the department took to support students through this tumultuous time and transition in the middle of the semester? Um, and if a similar situation were to occur in the spring, what would the department do differently? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think, I think there's a couple of things that, that factor into that. I know part of the feedback we've heard um, has been that we didn't do much to assist students in finding off-campus housing, um, and uh, and I certainly think there's 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 a there's a piece to that. Um, part of it was we really wanted at that juncture in where we were at a university, we were hoping students were going to go home. Classes were moving in uh, virtually. There was no necessary reason for students to be in town. Um, and so uh, in support of the, the greater, um, you know, community health effort, we really were encouraging folks to go home. That doesn't mean that the normal resources that the university provides for off-campus housing were not available. Um, you know, there is an off-campus website where we chronicle um, a number of properties that are available. And so, you know, that was an important distinction to understand in terms of the goal of, of that effort. It was really, and hopefully to have people, um, to have people study remotely from someplace other than um, the, the Chapel Hill community. Um, 
I also know another piece of feedback that came was about days off and, and how those were, were apportioned and things. And, and that's a very complicated question um, that has to do with how many days in session we have to have to meet accreditation requirements. And, and so certainly um, we were trying to be as sensitive as we could to that from a housing perspective in terms of how long we allowed people to stay on campus to move out, what kind of exceptions we made when students um, expressed that the, the timelines and deadlines that we had put forward um, you know, didn't meet their individual needs. We certainly made lots of exceptions, um, had lots of individual conversations to try and meet student needs. At the same time, we needed to adhere to a relatively quick timeline in order to serve the public health good that we were trying to achieve. We couldn't say, take the next month to move off campus. Um, that you know, that would work against some of the goals and some of the primary focus of the decisions that were being made about the need to move more virtual and to de-densify campus. And so those are two kind of uh, underlying principles that I don't think always are, are top of mind when you think about how it was that we facilitated that move out. Looking forward, um, we'll continue to try and have flexibility, allowance for as much time as we can, um, as we can reasonably afford um, and providing as many resources as we can to be part of uh, any, future, um, any future conversations about this. Let me first say, I hope we don't need to have those conversations, but if we do, we will certainly look back on, you know, on those lessons learned and on the feedback that, uh, that we've received to see if it makes sense, can we extend the period of time? Can we provide more resources? Can we do different things that will enable us to, uh, to serve students in a, in a different and better way? And I just like to add really quickly uh, another measure I think that is behind the scenes and students may not have been fully aware of is we did broaden quite a bit our definition of uh, hardship. So we wanted to make sure we were as inclusive as possible for students who did need to stay on campus. And so hardship generally um, refers to a student who may not have um, really a, a home to go back to. And so with the university looking to reduce the number of students in the Chapel Hill community, what we wanted to do is ensure that the students who were here had a reason to be here, but we extended that not only to students who were student athletes as folks may have seen because they were needing to be here for practice, um, we had ROTC students who needed to be here. We also had a category for any student who felt like returning home would put family members at risk because there was some high risk uh, individuals at home, whether that be a parent who um, it has any kind of health needs or even just um, a, a parent who works in healthcare and is, is wanting to protect the home environment. So we had a good number of students who we approved for that reason. We also included in hardship students who felt like they just were not going to be able to be as successful academically because maybe their, uh, their capacity to engage in online coursework from their home environment wasn't, wasn't substantial. So um, we found some of those needs were students who would be going home where there were other siblings that were also attending school online or parents who were working from online, putting a, a bit of a capacity on the internet structures. So we, we provided that to be an option for students to remain on campus. And in, in, in all of those circumstances, we were able to keep a good number of students um, on campus in that hardship category much more than we would typically have. So uh, we were very thoughtful and we reviewed, uh, Alan and I each reviewed every single hardship request and tried to look for the most, um, the best way that we could support any particular student need under those circumstances. Great, thank you so much for those answers. Our next question on fall 2020 reflection is, 
Why did Carolina Housing stop being transparent with its RAs and CDs with the increase of clusters on campus? And does Carolina Housing plan to be more transparent for the upcoming semester and allow RAs to be involved in the decision-making process? Um, I guess I'm a little confused by the question. Uh, what I think it might refer to is that um, we stopped using the Alert Carolina system at some point to announce clusters and switch to using the dashboard to announce them. Um, that was really not a change in how we defined clusters or whether or not um, you know, they were continuing to appear on campus. It was really a decision to um, use the most appropriate way to communicate those. Um, if you think about the Alert Carolina system, it is really set up for emergencies um, and communication uh, around um, evolving events that way. When we had the number of clusters that we had, um, there was um, good thought on behalf of everybody um, that we needed to change that communication methodology. So we didn't stop communicating. We, um, we just changed the methodology that we communicated to the campus about those needs. Nothing changed in how we communicated with the residents of those buildings. They continued to get an individual email um, as soon as the cluster was identified, giving them very specific instructions on what to do and what not to do. And, uh, and that is the plan going forward as we will continue to use um, the dashboard to communicate um, clusters and we will continue to communicate directly with those that have had greatest impact. Um, and I, I guess the, the role of the staff in that, um, uh, I'm not really sure that will change either, um, given that there's a very prescribed medical public health definition for a cluster, and it is not really up to really anybody in Carolina housing in terms of how that gets defined. Um, you know, that will be prescribed by the health department based on the number of cases that occur in a building over a certain period of time. Um, and so, uh, but we'd be open to working with the staff, you know, if the email communication is not enough, if there's other things we should be doing to communicate the importance of that email to try and make sure that, that everybody knows that that that, uh, that their building has become a cluster. Um, you know, we're wide open to conversations about that. But I think in terms of decision-making, um, you know, that, that's not even really a Carolina housing um, decision to open up to, to broader interpretation because it's very prescribed. Yeah, and I think there's an undertone to that question possibly about communication about you know, when these clusters arise. So, I mean, specifically in say Carmichael community, um, students and staff altogether would get a notification that there was a cluster in that building. Um, but I think what I've seen or heard concerns about were staff feeling that, you know, they're getting this information at the same time as students. And so how do you prepare for that? Um, so I guess maybe part of the question is, um, asking if you all have um, an opportunity to leverage connections with those that are in charge of the Alert Carolina system and maybe navigating a better way to communicate with staff in advance of a public announcement. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me answer that because A, we, we move as an institution as quickly as we can from the identification of the, of the cluster to it going on the, um, on the dashboard and then straight away to communication um, with that building. I mean, those happen almost simultaneously. Um, so there's not a lot of time to build in a delay to notify other groups. I would think that would really work counterintuitively to the speed at which we're trying to work. It's also very important that communication happen in the right way and using the right channels. And one of the risks in notifying the department, RAs, other people, is that they begin to communicate that message before students have a chance to read the university's message around a particular incident. And, and, and so we just have to be careful about it. There's pros and cons to that. Um, and I just think that there's a, you know, there's a real cadence to these things that is important in terms of people getting accurate and up-to-date information from the right source in the right timeline. Um, 
you know, and we, we certainly, you know, if we have the opportunity to involve staff at an earlier stage in that, we, we can certainly think about that. But I don't know that we'll want it to disrupt the speedy flow of the university's process. Awesome, thank you, Alan. Um, I didn't want to miss uh, Sineha's question in the chat. Why wouldn't a cluster be considered an emergency worth sending an alert to Carolina for? I think that's definitely a topic of conversation among leadership right now. Yep. Um, and something. And I think leadership to... will continue to make that decision. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, if the you know if if that changes, we'll we'll fall right in line with that. But uh, you know, there was a decision made to to change the notification process. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if that changes, you know, again, we'll certainly, uh, we'll certainly adhere to that. Right. And, and added by leadership, uh, we should be specific. It, it, it's a larger university wide. Yeah. It's a university wide decision that there's lots of input, um, including the CCAC group that's been convened that, uh, that care is a part of and, and other groups um, that really feed in. This is one of those ones where I talked about in, in my opening remarks that, you know, there are clear upsides, but there are also very clear downsides. Um, and uh, we just have to balance those out. And so um, I have confidence in university leadership that they'll continue to have that discussion and, and move us through. Awesome, thank you. Um, and RHA's contact information will be shared in the chat throughout the discussion today. So if there are follow-up questions on anything that's brought up, um, you can let us know. And also if you want us to advocate as an organization further directly with those that make these sorts of decisions, um, let us know that too. Um, so the next question um, is looking forward at the spring 21, um, 2021 planning. Uh, so the first question is a big issue with the spread of COVID-19 is people ignoring social distancing guidelines as part of the regulations put out by housing um, in the fall that only residents were allowed in rooms and no guests. How do you plan to prevent this from occurring in the spring? Um, we'll use some of the similar tactics that we used in the in the fall. Um, you know, first and foremost, it starts with the community believing in and adhering to our community standards. Um, you know, no amount of staff, no amount of enforcement is going to, to be honest, is going to stop the behavior. That is each individual student making a decision that they're not only committed to, um, you know, adhering to the, to the guidelines that they said they would adhere to um, by their attestation, but also that they they believe enough in our Tar Heel community that they realize that it's, I'm not just doing it for myself, I'm doing it for the greater community. I'm doing it for those in the building that are um, maybe otherwise immune compromised. I'm doing it for other people who can't go home if we end up, you know, uh, you know, with a cluster in our building or with a, you know, a situation. Um, you know, we, we just, we have to be all in this together. Um, layered on top of that, of course, are our community standards and the adjudication process that we will continue to use um, when we're made aware of, of people who are not living up to those standards. Um, and we have been very quick, I'm looking at Kayla right here because she has heard most of these um, 300 and some odd cases that have come up between um, August and now. You know, and we have removed a lot of people's ability to live on campus. We don't do that lightly. Again, we're not in the business of sending people home. We're in the business of creating a home for them. But yet, if they are not willing, especially in this, you know, critical public health crisis, to be part of the solution and part of the identified strategies that are going to help to keep our community safe, we can't we can't continue to house them. Um, and so we just need to stay really focused on that. Um, but it really starts with, uh, you know, we're really trying uh, to be much more transparent, to be much more right out front with, um, you know, with what our expectations are and being very clear that we expect people to live by those. Otherwise we're gonna have to make a different decision. Um, you know, and uh, I think that's what students are asking us to do, and it's certainly what we're prepared to do. And I'll, I'll add to that, um, thanks to Will for his question in the chat. And one of the things that we learned is 
uh, students want a little bit more transparency about how many individuals are facing the uh, the ramifications of, of losing their ability to live on campus as a result. And I believe um, by last count, it was uh, upwards close to close to 60. Um, and our vice chancellor, Amy Johnson, is going to be um, continuing to put out quarterly data for all students, for the public to know how many students we're hearing cases for, we're uh, reacting to, et cetera, so that students, parents, community members can all see um, how accountability is looking in terms of data. Um, but one thing I think is an important piece to also share, and I'm gonna ask somebody to share it in the chat and we can follow up, I'll share it with Kira as well, is there are two different pieces to accountability. There's what we see and what we document based on what we see, and that's our staff, whether it be our full-time staff or student staff. And it's also what you all tell us is happening based on what you observe. And so residents have the ability to document behaviors that they find are in violation of the university COVID guidelines. And we, we take that and we, we, if, we, if there's a student identified, because it's hard to kind of communicate with somebody who you don't know who it is, but if there's a student identified, even though we didn't see it, we send communication to that student, letting them know that, that their behavior has been observed as being a potential violation. We also keep track of that so that we see if we have, you know, kind of like lots of community members have submitted this student, we, we need to do something a little bit more. Um, but for everything that we do see and are documented by our staff as incidences, we do follow up on, and that will either end up in a sort of written notice, which is like your opportunity to review the guidelines, um, or a removal from housing. And really, those are our main two, two options. And sometimes it involves a meeting with the student to understand a little bit more about what happened in the situation, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, all of the decisions are followed up by an opportunity for that student to have that decision reviewed at a different level um, to provide a little bit of due process for that student. But this is an administrative decision. It's not a conduct decision. And when I, cl when I clarify that to mean we don't go through the, the, the normal nuances that we would do in a conduct where we would want to provide educational um, sanctions. This is really like the administ the privilege to live on campus could be ended by the fact that students aren't um, adhering to the guidelines because of the overall health and safety and severity of how important it is for all students to abide by them. So with nearly 60 students losing their housing, um, last fall, our goal in that is not to, to, as Alan said, just send people away. Our goal is to also, though, send very clearly a message about behaviors that are acceptable and what is not acceptable. We do need the community's help because we are eyes where we, we have them, but there are times where the community sees behaviors and we ask that students use the, the link that's available on the student conduct website to share observations that students have because we do follow up on those as well. Um, and then, what, to, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna share one thing that's true, not just of COVID related cases, but of all cases, because we've gotten this question too. Um, well, why can't you tell me what happened? Um, and it's just not a, it's just not appropriate ever in a conduct situation or an HR situation. I mean, there, there's a certain um, amount of privacy that needs to be afforded to the person that we're having these difficult conversations with. Um, and so there is not, and it's not appropriate to have there be a reporting mechanism back to the person who raises the concern. And I know sometimes that that looks like it's not transparent. And I think transparency has its its boundaries. And I think in this case, the privacy of that individual student and the process that we are engaging with them about their behavior um, is really not one that, that warrants transparency. And if you can put yourself on the other end of that conversation, um, and how would you feel if that was a made a matter of kind of public record? And so we're very, we're very cautious of the individual. We don't mind sharing the aggregate data as Amy Johnson will do, um, but we're very cautious about making sure that that's not identifiable back to a person. 
And one thing I'll add that's different for the spring than was for the fall is in the fall, we trained our staff to recognize that this is different. Like students aren't always gonna know exactly, you know, what are their behaviors um, mean in terms of COVID expectations at the university because these are new expectations. And so we really wanted to give a sort of warming up period to allow students to have reminders, you know, hey, you need to wear a mask in the hallway as well. You need to, um, you know, please put on your mask. Uh, we, we do refuse service if a student does not have a mask on. Um, we reminded students during opening in the fall. Well, we, we're, we're halfway through the year. We are, I'd love to say halfway through this pandemic, but I'm not a, a public health expert, but we are at least eight, nine months into this pandemic. And so the spring will not have a reminder period. The spring will be each situation is documented um, for a follow-up administrative response as if it was, you know, there's no, there's no reminders. We were very, and we'll be very clear with all students that there is an expectation. And, and let me also clarify one of the other things that we have heard, or I've heard, I, I hear these cases, is well, I, I, I thought they didn't apply to me, meaning they, the community standards, because I already tested positive for COVID, or I am practicing with my teammates, and so we practice together outside the residence halls so we should be able to hang out together and you know and visit each other in the residence halls and that is that's not an exception to the expectation so um and very clearly lay that out to students when i speak with them but we don't make exceptions to the final decision on whether a student is removed from housing or not based on whether a student thought that they these uh, guidelines didn't pertain to them because they had already had COVID and they were in whatever 90 days. None of that is relevant to the final decision where we hold students accountable for the expectations the university has set for. Awesome, let's jump to our next question. Will you allow students to cancel their housing contracts during the spring semester if classes go fully online again? And if yes, would those students face a cancellation fee? Um, that's one of those questions that's really hard to answer at this point. There's lots of things that go into that decision, including guidance from the UNC system, decisions by university leadership, um, and, and what that would uh, what that would all entail. And so that's not an answer I can I can give at this point. Um, and other than to double down again on what we said before, um, you know, we're doing everything we can and hopefully we'll enlist by, by conversations like this, all of you in hoping that we don't end up there, so. All right, thank you, Alan. The next question is if housing shuts down in the spring, will housing commit to refunding all students impacted by this? Um, and if not, why? That's a, the same answer to that other question, the refund and how that all works and whether it's a cancellation or a refund, that's all tied into how and when that decision is made and what the, what the, various, uh, what the various constraints are um, at that particular time. Um, and so uh, unfortunately that's an answer I can't, I can't give you at this point. Okay, now we have a student staff question. If there's a sudden shutdown of Carolina housing, um, how, or sorry, campus housing, how is housing prepared to navigate that in regards to student staff? In the fall semester, there was vague, unhelpful communication being sent out to student staff that kept them on edge for weeks regarding their employment status slash housing situation um, that increased stress rather than addressing issues or questions. So what will housing be doing differently to avoid the situation? Sure. Um... So as I said before, I know we've we've taken staff on a roller coaster ride with us, um, and certainly would want to um, avoid that if possible. First of all, by having to make any pivot. So, but if we were to have to make a pivot, again, it's really going to depend on the circumstances at that moment, what time of year it is, uh, what's going on. That's going to have us reflect upon um, the type of student staff model that we need to maintain or create. 
Um, and let me tell you that, you know, there was a delay and it was longer than any of us wanted between the time that we, we made the pivot and the time that we were crystal clear with our student staff. Um, but that was, there wasn't a day that went by in there that Kayla and I and others weren't on the phone trying to figure out what the right plan was, what our options were. Um, you know, there, when you're talking HR decisions, there's a whole, um, you know, area of the university that has to be pulled in. There's obviously financial ramifications. Most importantly, there was, you know, student well-being implications. We had this group of staff that, you know, that we, we care a lot about. Um, you know, we, we select them and train them and bring them into, you know, the Carolina housing family to help us serve students. And uh, so none of those decisions were made lightly. They did take a while um, in order to, uh, to churn their way through all those different mechanisms that I just talked about. Our hope would be to be able to do that quicker in the fall, but I also want to, or in the spring if we have to do it, but I also want to make sure that we don't, by being too speedy, miss an opportunity that could really advantage our students. Um, part of the, you know, the careful methodical process that we used was to make sure that every effort was made to be as, um, as uh, to give the advantage to our student staff um, in, in whatever ways we can. And so I don't wanna promise ultimate speed and then give up um, you know, that opportunity where we really do because we, we take a little bit more time, um, come up with a solution that's actually better for students. Yeah, I would just like to add sort of my sincerest regret in that situation, uh, the timely, not non-timely communication with our student staff. Because as Alan mentioned, you know, you go back. Those were some of the most, I think, stressful times because we were awaiting the, you know, just trying to figure out how we were able to move forward with all of the considerations. Uh, budget, HR, uh, impact on financial aid is a big one, um, and. What I will say is that the most important piece to that, which I know we will commit to, is giving our student staff as much advance notice as we can. And that is one of the things that we were able to do is to provide a distance between when we communicated what would happen and when it would impact them directly. And so that was a big part of us trying to make sure that we managed that better um, than we were able to in the spring, but giving more advance notice to give our student employees an opportunity to think through their choices in that as well. Great, thank you both. Um, I quickly just wanna give a shout out to the housing staff that's been providing these resources in the chat. Um, really appreciate it. Feel free to continue doing so. Mm -hmm. um, and students or um, parents or faculty or staff, if you have questions um, that are shared in the chat or on your mind right now, we will circle back um, on those in the last 20 minutes of discussion today. Um, so the next question um, is also a student staff question and it's a little bit lengthy, so bear with me here, but it's in regards to student staff safety um, in the pandemic. So, um, it says, what are you doing to support student housing staff for the spring 2021 semester? And specifically, what is housing prepared to do to ensure their safety under COVID-19 conditions? COVID-19 and the work of student staff places them at a higher degree of risk or danger than normal students due to the nature of their position. Will housing be paying student staff hazard pay because of this elevated risk? If no, why not? Um, and please provide a detailed explanation as to why not. Do you, do you sure, let me, okay. I was gonna say, let, me, let me try and tackle that. First of all, the, the hazard pay piece, that is a, uh, a designation that is um, not ours to, to provide. Um, that comes from um, you know, other places, the ability to award hazard pay. Um, and I, to be honest, I don't even know all the mechanisms that need to be in play in order to make that an option for supervisors to award hazard pay. All I know is that that is not in place right now um, for any of our staff. 
Um, and so that's the, you know, the kind of the quick and the dirty answer on that is that's not a, um, you know, a, a, an option to us at this point. I would also say, even if it were, um, I would rather take a different approach to that question. And I think this is the approach that Kayla and her team have taken is that we're trying to mitigate the risk and not send people into situations that have a significantly elevated level of risk. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, refusing service if someone is not wearing a mask or not willing to adhere to social distancing. That's done to protect the staff member from having to be in a situation where there is elevated risk. Um, you know, we've tried to really rethink all of our procedures, all of our protocols to take as much as we can into the virtual space so that we avoid that contact altogether for things that don't require human interaction. But things like a lock change or a, 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 a key in, um, if someone forgets their keys, we need to show up with a key. Somebody needs to, to, to physically do that. But there are so many ways that we can do that that, uh, that protects both the student and the staff member. And that's what we expect of our student staff. And so, you know, we have continued to, uh, you know, to look at all of those procedures, uh, you know, during these past few months, the guidance keeps changing uh, and we continue to, to flow with that. Um, but I really believe from our CD staff to our RAs, to our maintenance and housekeeping staff that we are doing the best we can to provide them the appropriate PPE and the appropriate guidance in terms of policy and procedure and training in order to make sure that there isn't a significantly elevated level of risk other than the element of risk that unfortunately we all share right now because of the, the shared nature of the, of the pandemic and the public health crisis that is going on. You know, there's just no way for us to uh, to to kind of overcome that um, because it's you know it's it's plaguing not just campus, not just the residence halls, but all of North Carolina. And unfortunately, you know, it's a global pandemic. And so, um, but I think within that confine, we have really tried to do everything we can to minimize that risk, and we'll continue to do so. You covered everything I was going to say. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And now we have some questions for RHA. So Kira, I'll direct these to you. How do you plan on interacting with the student body in the spring semester? Yeah, great question. Um, so as um, I'm pretty sure almost everyone knows on the call, RHA stands for the Residence Hall Association. And so we are the governing body that advocates for on-campus students. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work, um, you know, since the summer and continued into the fall to make sure that students feel heard and represented um, by not just our body, but the Carolina Housing Department. So uh, holding events like this town hall today, um, discussions with students in one on one conversations, um, those are all part of ways that we try to make sure that students um, know that there's an avenue for them to direct their concerns and have those concerns actually addressed. Um, so we'll continue to do programming. Um, our four pillars are programming, enhancements, advocacy, and recognition. And we'll continue to do all of that next semester. Great, thank you. And another question, um, what is the relationship between RHA and Carolina Housing? And what is the relationship between RHA and UNCPD? And on that note, how does RHA plan to support black and brown students living on campus? Yeah, yeah. Um, so lots of questions there. So firstly, just the relationship between um, housing and RHA, it's a very strong relationship that's uh, lasted for years. Um, and so we coordinate um, you know, efforts you know, back and forth between making sure that students uh, have their immediate concerns addressed where they're living and also um, moderate or sort of navigate ideas about how our organizations can grow and better address um, student concerns. So um, we have a strong relationship with the housing department. We are the student body um, that advocates for students. The department is made up of staff 
uh, that work for students, but both entities are in service of the residents. Um, relationship with UNCPD, uh, that's something that's been developing, um, I think over the years, but particularly in my capacity, especially this summer, um, through conversations about how UNCPD could um, build a better relationship with students who live on campus. Um, so some of those conversations started over the summer and I'm happy to answer more detailed questions about what occurred at the beginning of the fall semester. Um, but all in all, um, RHA is building a relationship with uh, UNCPD. Housing already has a relationship set up and uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, we hold our leaders accountable in those spaces and also acknowledge that the presence of police uh, impacts people very differently. And especially our uh, uh, black and brown individuals, um, people of color and other marginalized communities on campus. And so it's just very important to us that we acknowledge that, recognize that and are able to hold uh, leaders accountable to the decisions they make um, that are impacting the students they're serving. Um, and then uh, one last thing I just wanted to mention too about RHA's work um, and advocacy. So this year we've been uh, very involved in the building renaming process. And so in the summer, um, I served on a committee that the chancellor created. And essentially this committee was tasked with reviewing um, the first four buildings that had namesakes that were um, named after individuals who um, were not great individuals um, and who did a lot of harm uh, to the black community in, in particular, but um, other communities as well. And so I was part of the big decision to uh, remove the first four names of uh, some buildings on campus. And I am also going to be a part of the uh, construction of a renaming policy, um, which will be discussed more further in, in the spring semester. So. We're involved in a lot of different networks across campus um, within housing, but also at the university level as well. I, and I just want to give a shout out to Kara there because she, um, you know, is is amazing at what she does and has really forged relationships that RHA has not had before. Um, and I think that's a good credit to her and to her whole. Um, you know, uh, executive board and and to the governors and everybody who are really standing behind the RHA um, um, advocacy movement. Um, it's really been incredibly strong this year, and it's noticed. Um, and I think uh, you know we'll continue to support um, as decisions get made about unnaming and renaming. Um, we're ready to support those if they if they happen in in residential spaces. Um, and continue to, to work with, um, you know, University Police and RHA, um, you know, under Kayla's leadership, um, there's already been uh, reviews of many of our policies um, in terms of how we, um, how we utilize campus police in the residence halls and, and how those interactions take place. Um, and we'll continue to, to work together to, uh, to move in that direction. Awesome, thank you. Now let's go back to some spring 2021 general questions. How frequently will hall bathrooms and common spaces be cleaned and how often will students be required to be tested? Let me start backwards there on the testing piece. There's gonna be more information coming out from the university um, about, about the final testing decisions um, I know I've been part of conversations this week that communications are being worked on, final details are being ironed out. And so I think we're, I think we're close to having um, um, more information than potentially you will even want about testing and what it's gonna look like on campus. Um, there is a commitment that we know residential students are going to be tested, both a reentry test and some cadence of a ongoing testing protocol, um, but I don't have the details finalized on that yet, but they're, as I said, forthcoming. Um, going back, what was the first part of the question? I got all wrapped up in testing. How frequently will hall bathrooms and common? Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, this is another thing that we're constantly reviewing um, in terms of guidance. Um, and thankfully the guidance has been relatively consistent in this area. 
um, that there does not appear to be a high rate of transmission um, on bathroom fixtures, handrails, elevator buttons, those kinds of things. And so it is certainly an area we're continuing to pay attention to, but of the, um, of the elements of risk, um, because it's not airborne, that's the, that's the highest elevated risk, which is where masking, social distancing, and all the other protocols come in. Um, there's not as much concern about surfaces. That said, we uh, are going to continue to clean um, the common area lobbies, elevator buttons, elevators, handrails, um, multiple times a day. And the bathrooms will continue to get the bathrooms that we clean. There are some bathrooms in the apartments and in um, the Manning buildings that we don't clean, but the bathrooms that we do clean will continue to get at least daily attention, um, including weekends. Awesome, thank you both. Um, and then we have one last question before uh, we will start live questions. Um, and uh, this question is circling back on the discussion about enforcement. Um, so it says, will there be actual enforcement of social distancing uh, rules, um, including not allowing other people into others' residence halls? Um, so if you could just speak to the enforcement piece again um, there. Sure. So, and this actually plays in a little bit to mitigating staff risks. Um, our staff do conduct rounds um, of the community, which I think most residents are aware of. Um, and we've slightly adapted those because in a normal year, we would want those rounds to involve also like checking in on residents, talking with them, seeing how their exams are going, et cetera. Um, but we've really limited the interaction to more be, you know, observations as they're doing their rounds. And also to keep within social distance from each other, because typically staff do rounds together. Um, so when our staff see groups of congregated people that are not following social distancing, are not staying six feet apart, et cetera, they will talk with students and ask them to do that and to remind them. That is probably the only area where the reminders come back versus just the automatic enforcement. And if the students are non-compliant in that, they will be reported and that will follow through. And as the three residential uh, measures of enforcement for COVID, it is face mask, so uh, lack of wearing a face mask, uh, social distance, or we call it physical distancing, and visitation. Those are the three things. A lot of times they all come at the same time. Um, now, we also don't want our staff to go knocking on doors, seeing who's in each other's rooms, because that puts them at greater risk. So if there is um, an indication that there are people congregating in a residence hall room, usually that's a noise violation, or our staff becomes aware of it because a resident says, hey, I think you know my my sweet mate has a friend over, et cetera, and it'll be really easy to find out now because in the spring it's all single occupancy, so no roommates. So if there are indications that come to our attention or that we see, then our student staff will report those situations and those and that type of uh, physical distancing violation will come with a, a follow-up enforcement measure um, that could result in removal from housing. Yeah. Um, so I just wanna be clear that we want to both manage behavior, but protect student staff in the process. All right, thank you both. Uh, we will start uh, the live questions section. We're actually gonna circle back on some questions that were raised in the chat. So um, Ellie, I'll let you start the first question and then we'll bounce back. Um, for folks who have a question they'd like to share verbally, um, just raise your virtual hand and we'll acknowledge you that way. Thanks, Kira. So the first question I see is from Dave T who asks, with the rise in hospitalizations in the state, how will UNC facilitate health concerns? Um, I think Dave later corrected this number in the chat, but 
Um, it's at 71% and rising daily, having 300,000 plus on campus and much more off campus if someone has to go to the hospital, what is the plan uh, to get them care? And this is the second time staff has communicated concerns about in-person classes. Can you explain the disconnect with the faculty? Sure, let me answer the pieces of that that I can. Uh, certainly the relationship with the faculty and the university's response and working with them in decision-making is not really something I can speak to. Um, if Dave wants to email me, I'd be happy to send that along to somebody who can, can give a, a better answer than I. Um, but in terms of the, the kind of broad look at, at health and the availability of health care, that's where we'll continue to work with Campus Health, um, our hospital partners, and all of uh, all the people that are engaged in that enterprise, Orange County Health Department. Um, and that will continue to be one of the, the things that we continue to look at in terms of um, the continued um, ability for us to, to maintain quality access to health care, um, quality um, isolation and quarantine housing, all the pieces um, that go into responding from a healthcare perspective to this pandemic. We'll continue to, to watch those same indicators that were, were talked about. And I'm sure that will be part of what, uh, you know, what helps to drive decisions as we, as we move forward. Awesome, thank you both. Um, the next question I see is from Sinea. She said, or they said, touching on quantifying, with, will housing be able to specify how many confirmed cases are in the clusters? For example, when the cluster was announced in Erringhouse, we had no idea how many people were involved in the cluster, which made stress among students higher. Yeah, it's a great point. And it was actually something that was corrected, I think, by the third or the fourth cluster, those emails started to contain the number of cases at the time the email was sent. So we heard that feedback right away and actually made a midstream correction there. And so if you were in one of the later buildings, um, you actually saw a, a count um, in that. So, and we plan to continue that in the future. It will also be on the dashboard for, and the dashboard one will actually be a, a live count in terms of if it changes after the email goes out, that will continue to be updated um, if there are more cases that are affiliated with that particular cluster. And I know there was a question about the dashboard. It's on the website, so it is not just available to, um, to students. It's available to all of our community members, including parents and families. Awesome, thank you. So the next question from Sophia is, where is it possible to document an observed behavior that goes against community guidelines as a student? So, um, and thank you to folks who put it in the chat. Um, the link, the direct link is in the chat, I think a couple of times. So Krista Prince did that or Dr. Prince did that. Um, it is also on the Office of Student Conduct webpage. All right, um, next question is an RHA related question. Will in-person RHA events be limited or suspended this semester? In the fall, there are multiple events that could increase COVID exposure, such as the ice cream towers in Erring House. I'll, um, I'll, I'll address that. Okay. <laughs> and, and while we love to share um, the, the uh, feedback with RHA, uh, that was actually a housing event. And so it was not an RHA event. Um, and a lot of work went into preparing that event to ensure that it was socially distanced. But I think because of the layout of the building, we found that we had a more challenging scenario to do that than, than actually in the planning process. And so we've learned some things about how in-person events might need to uh, be marketed and be uh, sort of like staggered for this group can come at this time and this group and and also staffed and so um, I think both though what you'll find is until there's better guidance from the state not better guidance excuse me um, guidance from the state that would suggest that it is safe to do in-person programming 
um, with larger amount of students. Most of the programming that you will see either by, I'll speak for housing and potentially with RHA or on campus in general, will be limited to smaller groups that are in person, mostly outdoors. If not, if it's indoors, it'll be regulated with a certain amount of students that can attend at a specific time um, or really engaging interactive virtual opportunities. Let me just say, this is one that we keep getting feedback on both sides. We have a, a significant number of students and families that are saying, please get back to normal with this stuff. You know, my my son or daughter or I am, you know, kind of craving these kinds of community activities. Um, and, and we certainly hear that. And we certainly hear the other side of that, you know, in terms of that it's, you know, we can't wait to get back to it when it's safe to do so. And, and so we just, we need you to continue to, to come along with us on this adventure. And when there is good guidance that we can start to expand, whether that's because of the presence of a vaccine or we start to take some turns for some other reasons, um, we like you can't wait to get back to offering that kind of programming. Um, but we just, we have to, slow and steady is gonna win the race on this thing. And we just have to be really measured in how we, uh, in how we offer those things. And so we know that that means we're not meeting some of your needs and some of your expectations. We'll try and, and figure that out virtually, but it's just not the same. I think we all know that, um, um, but it's what we've got for now and we will continue to offer as creative and robust uh, virtual programs and small in-person programs as we can. Before we hop to the next question, I just want to take a moment to welcome Rick Bradley. Uh, he oh, Rick. is the uh, Director for Administrative Services with Carolina Housing. Um, so he's also here to answer questions and Rick, feel free to say hello. Yeah, hello everybody. Thank you for, for joining this. I was intentionally in the shadows because I'm not 100% sure during the first 30 minutes what I missed and didn't want to repeat, but <laughs> certainly uh, happy to answer questions as I can as well. Thanks Rick. Millie, you can take the next question. Thank you. So Malika asks, how will community guidelines be enforced in hall style dorms with shared bathrooms? And those who have double or triple rooms but are now single occupancy, will the furniture be removed? I can hit the enforcement piece and Alan, do you wanna hit the facilities issue? All right, um, so as I mentioned before, we enforce what we see. So I, I will not be expecting student staff to walk community bathrooms as a part of their rounds. Um, however, they are staff and use the restrooms just as anyone else does. And so they would be um, expected to report any violations um, in the restrooms as they would be in the hallways. So just as a reminder, and we tried to put very clear language on our website about this as well, our expectation is students are always masked indoors and outdoors but particularly the only place where students do not need to wear a mask is when they are in their room with the door closed, um, which of course by the visitation guidelines would mean they're in their room by themselves with the door closed. But we also understand you obviously can't brush your teeth or wash your face or take a shower with a mask on. And so we ask that students are traveling from their room to the community bathroom with their mask on and when they are needing to take their mask off briefly to do those things, we obviously understand we won't be reporting students who are brushing their teeth. Um, so that is a, just a little bit of a clarification about how we will enforce those guidelines in the bathrooms. And on the furniture piece, uh, just from a practical matter, and I'm sitting here looking at Debbie Uske, who's our assistant director for facilities. And I can't imagine if I had called her and said, hey, could you get rid of half the furniture in all the rooms? Um, so A, we just don't have a place to put it. It is a short term, hopefully, knock on wood, um, condition for us where by next fall, we are back hopefully to, uh, you know, to a, more of a sense of normalcy and normal occupancy. And so we are just not in a position to be able to take that furniture out of the rooms. So you can push the beds together and have a king size bed. All right, um, the next question is about quarantine and isolation. So will there be moves toward increasing quarantine and isolation dorm capacity uh, since the university filled those dorms pretty early on into the semester? Uh, 
Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, yeah so we've, we've actually tripled the size um, a number of beds that we have on campus, as well as maintaining the contracts with the hotels that we used last fall. And so um, we've significantly increased um, the capacity there, uh, should it be needed. Okay, and I think our, oh yeah, I think our last question is from Christina who asks, how will medical exemptions for masks work? It's a great question. Um, and I don't know all the ins and outs. I do know that uh, students who have any medical needs in that way should go to the Accessibility Resources Office and they will guide them through the, the process the documentation process in order to get the accommodation, but then also we'll work with them in terms of um, notifying whomever needs to know that that exception has been made. Um, and so I will uh, ask that that question be kind of redirected a little bit. And again, if somebody wants to email me that directly, I can certainly get it to, uh, to our colleagues up there and, and make sure that they get a good answer. If I can just add, um, an additional point to the earlier question about quarantine isolation housing. Um, this has been a really interesting um, and rewarding, I think, part of learning how to um, support this effort. And uh, Dr. Ashley Gray, I think, is on as well. She has been leading this effort for our university in providing this housing. Um, not only have we increased the number of spaces, but we've also um, worked with feedback from the community and from just multiple different folks that have experienced quarantine isolation housing to improve the experience, I think. Um, and we have had some very positive uh, feedback from students who have been, you know, who have had to be in isolation and quarantine housing this fall, but the, the improvements that have been put in place, I think will, will definitely assist students as they have to regrettably, you know, move temporarily for a period of time outside of their assigned spring space um, onto our isolation quarantine housing. So some buildings, some additional buildings have been identified. Um, every student will have, as they have before, um, their own bathroom, their own bedroom. Um, they will be able to select their meal choices for the next day, which is an improvement um, or an, a new option. And so I just want to say thank you to our, our partnership with Carolina Dining Services, who has put a lot of work into creating that um, aspect, um, as well as um, students. And I know there was an article in the DTH, um, because of the nature of how the building is structured, um, we've been given the opportunity to allow a student who is in quarantine housing to not have to move twice, um, which is a benefit to students. And so all of those things uh, serve as lessons learned from last semester, but really provide a, a better experience for the short term that students are in our, our buildings for quarantine isolation. And Ashley, thank you for all your work on that. Did you wanna have anything additional to share? Uh, no, I think that cover, uh, and I guess additionally to, um, we will be standing up, there's an uh, on-campus isolation quarantine support hub um, that will be giving uh, uh, routine calls out to students in isolation and quarantine, and that practice has, has been going on now for the past two and a half months or so, where students get, get receive calls daily, because um, we understand that although people are given bunches of numbers, it, it can take it can be intimidating to reach out if you forgot your toothbrush, for example, but it might be a little bit easier if someone calls you and says, hey, how, is it, how are you doing? Um, and that we are able to, to navigate and have kind of a robust staffing structure to help with some of those things. Um, and so that was a, a, a change, the specific change from being, here's a bunch of numbers where you can call somebody to we uh, guaranteed routine calls. And just a quick follow-up to that, have specific buildings been assigned already for those extra quarantine isolation residence halls and which ones are they just for the knowledge of the group? Yeah, so we're, uh, we're continuing to use Craig North um, and then we're using um, Craig as, uh, so the high rise Craig Hall just behind Craig North and then um, 
Cor no, which Horton, uh, Horton. Horton, thank you. I, I had Corey stuck in my head and I knew that wasn't right. Um, so Horton, so all three within close proximity, easier for dining and, and us to support, um, adds a significant amount of capacity. All the buildings have elevators, which will make moving in um, easier, all those kinds of things. So we're excited to, to have them together and uh, really be able to support students using, uh, using them. Okay, thank you both. Um, another question uh, by Will. Will those who are currently in hardship and living on campus this spring receive priority in terms of housing assignments for next fall? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Um, so we always work with students that have um, hardships in terms of special accommodation needs for their housing. And just keep in mind that the students that are with us this fall that are under a hardship and special circumstance case is much broader than um, what would be considered um, priority housing options for students that are uh, students who have accessibility issues or, or things, medical accommodation needs. Uh, but we will continue to prioritize those students um, for fall assignments as we, as we always have. Let me just add more broadly, we are hoping that we um, return to a more normal occupancy and, and some of our more normal pathways to, to applying. Um, which means that we won't give the same priority to this year's hardship group other than the ones that Rick identified that always have priority. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be continued special circumstances housing. There always is. We always hear from students and try and work one-on-one -on -one as best we can. But as a matter of broad priority, living on campus this fall or last fall or this spring um, will not have an impact on next fall. Okay, so I think that answers Will, Will's question. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, I don't see any further questions at this time, but I'm just gonna allow for a couple seconds for people to ask any final questions. Um, and if not, I just wanna remind you all that you can reach out to us at any time at rha at unc.edu, that's our email. Um, and you can reach out to the Carolina Housing Department by emailing housing at unc.edu. And our contact information will also be shared in the chat. Looks like we've got a question there. Will there be any virtual RLPs in the spring? Our hope is to resume our programming with RLPs. Um, it will definitely be based on numbers. So we do have one uh, very active RLP that has continued throughout the fall and will continue in the spring. Um, and I'm excited about that one and that, that's in uh, Pride Place. Um, and we will continue to offer and you know, reach out and try to engage students that are assigned within our RLP areas to see, you know, to gather interest of continuing to do virtual programming for our RLPs. We also, in a partnership with, uh, with the music department, they had a number of students who needed to return uh, to, to uh, begin or continue their, um, their performance-based uh, studies. Um, and we actually have 15 of them living together by their request. And we'll be working with them to see what kind of virtual engagement um, that they're interested in, in having. Um, and uh, so we even have a, a new opportunity in the midst of COVID that has emerged. So we're looking forward to that. All right, I think we've seen a slowdown in questions. Um, so again, I just want to thank you all for joining us. A uh, special thank you to um, Alan, Kayla, and Rick uh, for answering questions, to the additional housing staff members on the call who are active in the chat. Um, really appreciate all this conversation. I think this um, was really helpful and um, added a lot of insight on um, you know, what occurred in the fall and plans for the spring semester. So. Appreciate all of you for joining. Um, I will hang out on the call um, with the executive board 
We'll hang out on the call for a few more minutes if there are follow-up questions. Um, but aside from that, I hope everyone has a wonderful winter break um, and we will be in touch in the spring. <laughs>